Just blocks away from the bustling heart of the city, we find a beautiful garden built for respite and retreat. You won't want to miss it, so stay tuned as we Garden Smart from Mobile. These moments of beauty and relaxation are brought to you by Proven Winners Flowering Shrubs, where every plant is performance tested, leaving you free to just enjoy. Find our award-winning shrubs at your local garden center. Now more than ever, our homes are our havens, where we learn, love, and live. Let garden projects, inspired or simple, bring beauty and comfort to you. Wherever you choose to plant good, we're with you. DRAM has been providing gardeners with professional equipment for over 80 years. DRAM products feature nine water patterns and are designed to nurture your plants with a shower of rain. DRAM for lawn and garden, available at garden centers near you. You have to rely on your gear, the way it feels, the way it does exactly what you need it to do. The F-Pace, how Jaguar makes an SUV. Cornerstone Gardens was built as a retreat for ministers, missionaries, and evangelists who come to stay in the adjacent carriage house to reflect and recharge. A collection of gardens, it features a formal British garden, a fragrance garden, a woodland Japanese garden, and a camellia garden. Scattered throughout are quiet places for visitors to sit, reflect, and simply enjoy the breathtaking views. The vision for the garden was born when Vaughn Drinkard broke ground on a vacant lot adjacent to his home to pursue his dream of creating a place of beauty for the weary to recharge and a place where people can come explore beautiful and unusual plants. Today we spend the day with Vaughn as he walks us through his little slice of heaven. Vaughn, thanks so much for joining us. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Eric. Good to be here. It's wonderful to visit Cornerstone Gardens and it's, it's one of those little like tucked away like hidden gems and, uh, and I love I love finding these gardens. When we, when we drove up here, um, you know, I saw one of our guys. This this is one of those gardens where you know there's going to be something fantastic on the other side of the gate. So I'm so happy to be here. Well, it's great to have y'all here, and I'm looking forward to y'all seeing what the Cornerstone Gardens is all about. Great. Well, let's just talk to us about about how you got this started. What was that? Cornerstone Gardens is also you know a garden with a bit of a mission and a vision. Well, it is. Uh, when I retired from law practice the first time, I'm back in it now a little bit, uh, my wife and I said, what can we do to give back to the Lord other than our church work? Mm -hmm. And we had a, a back house behind the old house here uh, called the carriage house. And we said, we'll bring pastors in for short periods of time for respite and repose. And so I said, well, I'll build a garden in this old green space here that I've had, and we'll let that be a meditation and prayer garden for the pastors. And one thing led to another. We built a British garden, and the public immediately started wanting to come in and see what this green space was, and the rest is history. Well, and you mentioned the, the public's interaction with the garden. It, when we're, especially when we're in larger cities, and green space oftentimes can be limited. I know in Atlanta, where I live, that's, that is definitely an issue. And so as they discovered this, this also became a garden for the community. Yes, it's a private garden open to the public now. The, the, you don't have green, private green spaces in downtown Mobile as in many large cities, and this is one of them. And uh, people just going down Government Street saw it one day and they said, what is this? And so just out of curiosity, they wandered in and, and they come in now uh, all the time. So you're on just over an acre and you've, you've got a lot of action packed into a very small space. We do. We do. The first garden that we'll walk into in just a minute is an uh, informal British garden. And the reason I say informal is that I've got other things other than boxwood and holly, as you normally find in a true British garden. 
and everything in this British garden area that blooms is white. So it's a white informal British garden with other plants other than boxwood and, and holly. Then in the back of the property is a, the next largest garden is a Japanese garden. And then there's smaller gardens that uh, contribute to the larger garden. Great. Well, I can't wait to see it. Let's go take a look. Let's go see it. Vaughn, well, I think there's something so peaceful about formal gardens. There's a, a structure and an order to them. And and there's a way of just putting your putting your mind at rest at ease because there's not the chaotic nature of like a lot of you know texture and color going on. Yeah. So I think for a meditation garden, this is a very natural element and that's what you've designed here. Eric, the human mind wants uh, order and peace, and that's what we've tried to do in this English garden. The garden is laid out such as you see that it's in quadrants. Plants I've laid out such as the Indian hawthorn and the gardenias and the sasanquas, uh, which make it an informal British garden in my definition, uh, will all come together if you close the quadrants together. So it's ordered in a very special way. And of course, all the plants that bloom from the gate to the koi pond are white. And a white has a piece to it. Absolutely. One thing too, that I love white gardens. And one reason why I love white gardens is because some of the most fragrant plants on the planet are white flowering plants. That's right. And I think fragrance oftentimes is, is an underrated aspect of gardening, you know, because it engages that other sense. You know, so we're engaging yeah. our ears with this palette and our eyes with this beautiful color and texture, but then introducing fragrance, which, you know, you've got gardenias, you've got jasmine, you know, you've got many, many fragrant plants here, roses. Yes. Uh, it's just another layer to the garden that once again, soothes you, puts your mind at rest and, and you know, Yes. I think really just, like I said, it adds like that third dimension. We have basically on the property over 175 different species of flowers and trees. And the best I can figure, uh, of course, we have more under propagation, but we have about 7,000 plants on the, wow. in the garden. So it's a, it's a, a nice size, small, I call it, a botanical garden. I want to talk about the design of the British garden. Um, you know, you've gone well beyond just the traditional, you know, formal boxwoods, and you've introduced, well, boxwoods and hollies, what we would expect in a British garden. Right. But you've introduced a lot of other, you know, plants that would not typically be incorporated into a traditional formal garden. Yes. The Natchez, uh, Lagostromia, or crape myrtle, the Indian hawthorn, we have many Noyuki Sasanqua, that's a favorite of mine. Mm -hmm. We have white uh, Lorpetalum, uh, of course, the camellias are all around. I uh, have the camellias dispersed throughout. Wonderful. Well, you did a great job with this beautiful one. Thank you so much. Well, some of the most tranquil and peaceful gardens I've ever been in are Japanese gardens. And of course, the, the thought behind that kind of gardening is creating this sense of tranquility and peace. You know, you've got water features, you've got hardscape, um, and just even the way that the garden path winds around corners and you know opens up into like quiet almost like private rooms in the garden is all part of the thought that goes behind this garden so i want you to talk about the design of this japanese garden be glad to eric this is a small woodlands japanese garden and uh it's made up of a half path well, many japanese gardens are an oval path from start to finish this is a half path from the tori gate to the uh, lotus pond and then it comes back with a dry stream bed or a, a simulated dry stream bed. We used four tons of river rock hmm. laid side by side to make that stream bed effect. And uh, the lotus pond in the rear is one of the three garden features. That another garden feature is the slate pond that we use for, with excess slate off the roof of my 1903 house <laughs> when Katrina came through. We made a nice uh, fountain out of that. Then we have another interesting fountain called a Shishio Dashi, which in Japanese is, uh, is interpreted deer chaser. It's made to make noise to chase the deer away from gardens and other uh, rodents and things. And I tell people that I tour through here, Eric, that it's working because I've never seen a deer in here. <laughs> but uh, it is a very peaceful place. I'll come out in the morning and uh, I have meditation study and have my coffee and it's just a, and it seems to always be cool in this garden. Well it is nicely shaded too which is important is. in the southeast. A lot, a lot of live oaks in here and we've got some old tallow trees uh, and, and the like. Let's talk about the plants that you've selected for this garden. Of course we would expect to find mostly Japanese or Chinese 
plants here. But some, what are some of the ones that have worked particularly well for you? 80% of the plants in this garden are Japanese and Chinese. And of course, we've got our camellias that we love that uh, come from both places. And they're throughout all of the garden, including the British garden. We have five species of Japanese maple trees, which we appreciate. And uh, loquats are in the garden and other things such as that. Well, I love, I love the juxtaposition of, of the different colors and textures. You know, and, and, and for a Japanese garden, there, there are a lot of like lively, more variegated plants, purple foliage, you know, like with this, you know, weeping war petalum here. And so, yes. you know, it, it does have like little peaceful areas to, to kind of rest and meditate, um, but then really nice feature plants throughout. Absolutely, and as you talked about earlier, there are rooms in the garden, basically, as you make the various turns. Even though it's a very small garden because of the space we have, uh, as you make the various turns, you come into another area that kind of is surprising, depending on what you come up on. Right, and that's great design. Very good design. There's hardly a corner in this garden that does not feature a camellia, and of course, there are hundreds of them here. And I'm assuming that is because you come from a long line of camellia devotees. It's in your blood. Eric, it is. My grandfather, Cliff Harris, uh, bought the Longview Nursery in the early 50s mm. from R.O. Rubel. Mr. Rubel was one of the earliest uh, camellia hybridizers in the country. Pop developed, among other uh, flowers, the Queen Elizabeth II when the new queen went on the throne and the uh, monarchy sent an emissary over to get her plant. And interestingly, I corresponded with the royal gardener about five years ago, and the progeny from that plant is still in the uh, royal palace uh, garden. Uh, among others, uh, Walter D. Bellingraff, uh, Pop was a friend of Mr. Bell and uh, named his plant. My dad, Blanding Drinker, uh, was a longtime camellia man, worked at Longview Nursery as the foreman of the wow. nursery, and so I uh, learned a lot from Mr. Rubel. He named uh, many camellia plants, including the Earl Stanley Gardner of Perry Mason fame. Uh, we've got about 225 cultivars on the property, and many of them, uh, my uh, either grandfather or, or dad developed. Wow, well let's let's not fail to mention there's a Vaughn camellia as well, right? Vaughn, Vaughn Drinkard, my grandfather named one after <laughs> me, the grandson that was about three years old at the time. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. Yeah, uh, what, a, what a wonderful legacy. What it's a, wonderful it's legacy. a great legacy. Camellias are a great uh, hobby. Uh, most of the camellias have a history uh, Bob Hope is across the way here. Of course, we know mm -hmm. the great comedian, and right. uh, every comedian has a, a namesake. And the reason we graft is to, to recreate the exact, if we do a Bob Hope uh, cutting, we're going to create the exact Bob Hope camellia. It's the DNA, just like Eric's is the one and only DNA in the world. Uh, Bob Hope is the one and only. So that's the fun of camellias. Absolutely. Well, it's a very rewarding category of plants. It, it'd be hard to imagine a Southern garden that didn't have a camellia in it. No. And, um, and they're, they're very long lived, of course, super colorful. And one thing that I've always loved about camellias and why I've always had them in my garden is this wonderful shiny green foliage. So year round, it's a wonderful like show of flowers, yeah. but then also it's a great like structural plant for the garden. And uh, of course, you know, they're abundant here and it's wonderful to see. They're evergreen, they're hard to kill. They're, they're disease resistant for the most part and they're wonderful queen flowers of the year. There are so many amazing cultivars that exist in the world of horticulture, and I think it's important to talk about what a cultivar is, just in brief. Uh, a cultivar is a clonal copy of that plant that we love. So if in your garden you find a seedling camellia that has all the attributes that you want, you want to propagate it by taking a stem from that plant yes. and either vegetatively propagating it by a cutting, you know, so we could take this cutting, dip it in a rooting hormone, put it into like, you know, a potting soil, put it into a greenhouse, and then perhaps it would form adventitious roots. Well, now this plant is gonna be clonally identical to its parent. Correct. Or we could use air layering. We see that a lot of times with Japanese maples and many other like difficult to propagate plants. Yes. Um, but of course, grafting is what has dominated uh, the industry for many, many years, especially if you go back 80, 100 years, that was the way it was done. And you've been grafting plants for how many years now? 60 years. Wow, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and that's that's your, your method of choice for, for propagating camellias. And you've been kind enough to uh, offer to 
show everyone how it's done. Glad to do it, Eric. Uh, the, this is a Bob Hope. We talked about that earlier. So right. I'm just taking this uh, cutting. Camille people call it a scion. I am the scion of my dad. This is the scion of Bob Hope. This will be the one and only Bob Hope DNA when it uh, takes on the graft. I use a Sasakwa, which is a not a, a beautiful plant to most people. It's a pretty camellia, but it's mm -hmm. a hedgerow basically. But it's a it's root rot resistant, and uh, it's a hardy grower. So that's what I call the mother plant. I've shaved off a uh, exposed my wood uh, by a angular cut uh, two ways, and I'm uh, I'm exposing the cambium layer or the growth cell layer of the plant. Uh, I've done that on my sign of Bob Hope. I'm now going to soak that in some fungicide while I cut my mother plant. And what I'm going to do here, I'm preparing to make a cleft graft, a cleft incision in the mother plant. And what I'm doing now, Eric, is exposing the cambium layer. Yeah, the cambium is only a few cell layers deep. And so it's, it's, that, it's that little layer between the phloem and the xylem. And that's actually what translocates the nutrition from the rootstock to the correct. top of the plant. That is correct, and the, and the, the, the cambium layer between the phloem and the xylem uh, is the, the growth cell exactly. uh, of the plant. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, make a cleft graft now with my knife. I'm gonna take the blade of my knife right below the cambium layer, about a quarter of an inch. I'm going to use some growth hormone. Some people don't do this. I've done it for 60 years because my dad did it. And I have about an 80% uh, success ra uh, ratio, sometimes 85 if I'm wow. lucky. And uh, uh, so I'm still doing the same thing I've done it for all these well, years. It's not broken. And it's not broken. <laughs> don't fix it. That's my theory. This is just standard hormone you can get in any store, any hardware store on my rootstock. I'm going to line my wood up. I'm going to open it with the blade of my knife. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, to put this in angularly so I cross the cambium layer. It used to be when I first started grafting, Dad would put it straight down and try to catch the cambium layer. Right. If you angular, put it in an angle, Eric, there's no way you're going to miss the cambium layer, and that's why I put it at an angle. Right, it just improves the probability that those little, like three or four cells deep, actually that is that a, green on green has to touch that is exactly right and then i bring the the end of the cyan out the other end of the cut and i actually run my finger across it and see that has crossed the cambium layer the cambium layer of the cyan with the cambium layer of the mother plant now for added uh, tensile strength i put a rubber band uh, some uh, grafters do not do this uh, i do it just about every time because my dad did it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You'll hear that several times. Even though I'm in a greenhouse, uh, we're going to put this in a little small greenhouse out of this uh, styrofoam 32 inch uh, cup. I'm going to build a base to my greenhouse with wet sand. That does two things it, it, it's a foundation to my greenhouse and it uh, retains moisture right, right. for the plant. Now, one big thing with camellia lovers is identification. Uh, as soon as I cut off uh, this cyan from Bob Hope, I wrote Bob Hope under the, t uh, the highest leaf. And then I'm going to, on my greenhouse, put Bob Hope, as I've done here. So I'll always know exactly what this graft is until it sprouts uh, growth. And under this greenhouse, I tell people to give it about eight weeks and the growth is going to come out of that growth bud if it has taken. And uh, then we'll cut a small hole in the top of the greenhouse with a pencil. That growth will go to the sunlight in that hole. As it, as it starts bumping the top of the cup, I'll actually cut that hole out larger and larger. So the, the top of the cup will, will eventually be cut out totally. I'm going to cut these leaves a little bit so the growth will be growing to the growth bud and not to support the leaves. Yeah, that limits transpiration or the water loss through the leaves, so you help keep more of that water inside of your of your cutting. That is exactly right. Now, to, to, to see how, how I want my son to, to do the photosynthesis deal on top of the leaves, so I orient, I, I'm going to orient this uh, pot toward the morning sun. So I'm using my Bob Hope signage 
to show me where those leaves are pointed toward the sun, okay? Some people will go six weeks. I say, let it, if it's, if it's growing, it's going to still be growing in eight weeks. Right, uh, right. Give yourself eight weeks. Uh, and all of these uh, uh, pots you see around this greenhouse, I've got about 100 now. I'm waiting eight weeks. Yeah, so there's an art and a science to it, but as, as we can see, it's, it's not super complicated. And, you know, just with practice and trial and error, Pretty much everyone can learn how to graft their own plants. Absolutely, and it's, it's a great pastime. Absolutely, great. Many of our viewers, they don't have an, an acre to plant plants into. You know, what if they only have a brick courtyard or a patio? Small spaces are very common nowadays. We don't have large estates. And a couple of things I noticed here that I think are, are great solutions uh, for those kind of spaces or of course, growing in containers. Containers are, are so good for things well beyond annuals, perennials, and then also raised beds. My dad uh, really was one of the first ones from Mr. Rubel that uh, did container gardening okay. and container growing of camellias. And the way they did that was to uh, was a specific kind of soil. It was, as I recall, three parts uh, uh, pine bark, one part uh, peat, uh, one part sand, and of course uh, a little lime is necessary, and 888 is necessary. And that can is the constituency of my pot gardening, my uh, container gardening, and the raised beds. Fertilization of camellias is very important. If you want the bloom, blooms that we had this year that just burst out and were lovely, uh, you want to uh, use a 1266 solution. Uh, generally 1366 depending on where you buy it and then you want to do it uh, first of April very soon on us okay. now and first of June two times at least my dad would do it sometimes one more time first of September <laughs> and of course because my dad did it and was very successful I do it pruning uh, you uh, prune right after the bloom stop blooming right. and you can uh, prune a camellia back almost to half of its size oh, wow. if you want to but it, it just shows you the incredible flexibility of that plant. Right. Um, and then, of course, your point, prune them right after they bloom, you know, as they set buds on new wood. So we want to make sure that we don't ruin our next season of flowers. Right. Every time I visit a new garden and meet a new gardener friend, I, I love to pick their brain for their, for their, their gardening stories. Everyone has that you know, a, a, a plethora of like really neat gardening stories or, you know, just, you know, the, the interesting people that they've met along the way. And, uh, and, of, and of course, I know that you've got probably a million stories, but I want you to leave us with one story that, that particularly makes you smile. Eric, one of my favorite stories in the Cornerstone Gardens is about the, the staghorn fern. Uh, several years ago, I had a small staghorn fern about a foot diameter and lost it. And uh, I mentioned to a fellow master gardener that I'd lost that staghorn fern. She said, with kind of a wry grin, would you like a new staghorn fern to replace that? I said, sure, thinking I would get one about that size. Right. She and her husband drove up in the back of a pickup truck with this huge, at that time, 37-year-old staghorn fern. Wow. Now, the story is... Uh, Carol Dorsey and her husband Bob uh, were given this staghorn fern 30 now 39 years ago <laughs> and of course as you know they're extremely cold sensitive right right and so they would br bring this staghorn fern up two stories uh, to their unused bathroom on the second story to keep it out of the cold so here's your new <laughs> staghorn fern and it's a great species one of the best species I've seen of the staghorn oh, fern. Oh that's a beautiful specimen wow. Thank you. Vaughn, we've had so much fun today, and we've also learned so much from you. Thank you so much for spending the afternoon with us. It's been a privilege having you all, Larry. Each week, we travel the country north to south, east to west, visiting some of the most exciting gardens, as well as talking to industry horticulturalists about design principles, new plants, and also how you can be most successful with your home gardens. We also love answering your gardening questions, so visit us on the web at Gardensmart.com. These moments of beauty and relaxation are brought to you by Proven Winners Flowering Shrubs, where every plant is performance tested, leaving you free to just enjoy.
Find our award-winning shrubs at your local garden center. Now more than ever, our homes are our havens, where we learn, love, and live. Let garden projects, inspired or simple, bring beauty and comfort to you. Wherever you choose to plant good, we're with you. DRAM has been providing gardeners with professional equipment for over 80 years. DRAM products feature nine water patterns and are designed to nurture your plants with a shower of rain. DRAM for lawn and garden, available at garden centers near you. You have to rely on your gear, the way it feels, the way it does exactly what you need it to do. VF Pace, how Jaguar makes it SUV. It's difficult to underestimate the impact of a beautiful garden on the human soul and how important it is to have places of beauty where we can reconnect with ourselves and nature. If you have questions about anything you've seen, visit us on the web at Gardensmart.com. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram. And remember, even if you're a master gardener, there's always more to learn. So join us next week for more exciting gardening tips and ideas as we garden smart.